we welcome in a man who knows what's up. This NBA veteran played 10 years in the league for seven franchises where he scored 2,150 points. He was inducted into the Alabama Hall of Fame in 2015. The man who has a great golfing game and attire. The man who always orders the salmon at his favorite diner with a side of a lottery ticket. The reason I know that, him and I make bets and the loser treats the other. This man is so popular, he has people making face, face, fake Facebooks of him. We welcome in Ennis Watley. What's going on? Not much, my friend. Eric, I call him the barbershop guy. We met at the barbershop. We've been friends ever since. But uh, thank you guys for having <laughs> me. Yeah, Ennis, you know, it's been a little while. How are you and your family doing? You know, I, I know that we're kind of seeing the light at the end of the tunnel with COVID. Yeah, everybody doing good. You know, um, I guess trying to stay out this heat wave, man, and just, you know, just trying to stay safe, patiently waiting it out, you know. Yeah, and uh, I can certainly tell that you haven't been skipping out on the gym looking jacked over there. I see the, the left bicep. But Ennis, what I like to do is start with the early years. Now, you played your high school ball at Phillips High School in Birmingham, Alabama, and you'd attend the University of Alabama, where your two years were stellar. Your sophomore year, you averaged 15.2 points per game, 6.9 assists, four rebounds. You were first team parade All-American and Mr. or Alabama Mr. Basketball in 1981. But I know that Brad had a question about how you grew up. Yeah. Hey, Ennis. Um, I'm curious, you know, how, how maturing in a civil rights era, Alabama shaped your basketball career, you know, and, and further, how did you experience, how did your experience as a kid affect where you decided to play college ball? Well, Brad, it's, it's, it's something that uh, really have, have shaped my life. You know, uh, I'm from Birmingham, of course, uh, you know that, but, uh, I grew up, uh, my address was 1319 17th Street North in the, in the march with the civil rights uh, where the four girls uh, ended up being in, in, in the bomb uh, in, in Dr. King's situation uh, was 16th Street. So I, I grew up one street over from actually where it happened. It was, wow. it was, it was interesting. a lot of history, man. And, um, you know, that's, that's my hometown. Yeah, yeah. And did it... Was it tough growing up in that in that kind of time period or did it help shape, you know, where you went to college? Did you decide, like, I wanted to stay close to home or how did that work out for you? Well, you know, uh, like in the 60s, in, in that era that we was in, you know, for, especially for blacks at that time, you know, a lot of people, a lot of black uh, guys didn't go to the University of Alabama at that time. So right. it, it definitely, uh, you know, it shaped up real well. But uh it was a period of time where, you know, just uncertainty and just, you know, from the history uh, background, you know, we have a lot of history uh, uh, being in, uh, from Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, actually, uh, my um, little short story, my my principal was Mr. Robinson, which where I went to school at, at Martin Elementary. And um, we would see Mr. Robinson uh, in the hallway and he kind of like would be crying a little bit. And we were like, uh, yeah, we didn't understand. We were like, well, what's wrong, what's wrong with Mr. Robinson? Uh, they were saying he was sad because his his daughter Carol Robinson, uh, one of the uh, girls that got in up being in the bombing, he would cry every day, you know that you know that that anniversary would come around. So it really shaped you know a history and just knowing just going to Martin Elementary School and just living one street over, man. It's a lot of history, man. So I, it plays a, a huge important part in my life. I imagine that definitely put basketball in perspective for you. Yes, it does. Yeah. Well. And as you made the right decision attending the University of Alabama, you were drafted by the Royals with the 13th pick in the 1983 NBA draft to the Kansas City Kings, but you'd actually never play for them as you were traded to the Bulls for Mark Olberding, which doesn't even sound like a real player. But I know James had a question about the draft process. Yeah, so we've had a, quite a few professional players on telling us that uh, getting traded was something that helped them learn the business of the game. Uh, but so early in your career, I mean, before you even played a single NBA game, uh, all you kind of really knew was Alabama. You grew up there, you went to college there and you get your name called by the Kansas city Kings. And then on that night, you, the, you get sent to the bright lights of the Chicago bulls. Uh, did that mess with your self-confidence and just kind of take us through how, you know, getting traded before you even played your, your first NBA game. 
Well, you know, back then, uh, going to New York, uh, I guess they didn't invite a lot of people up at that time, you know. And uh, by me leaving out as a sophomore, you know, um, especially being from the University of Alabama, that was kind of like the cardinal sin, never do that. So I didn't, I didn't want to go up in New York. Um, and, and so I ended up staying, you know, with my agent in Houston, uh, and, and just staying by the phone and everything. But I was so excited, uh, to just be drafted. You know, I was like, you know, yeah. I shake my hand and say, Oh, great. I got drafted. And they said, Oh, by the way, you just been traded. So <laughs> it was a short lived uh, thing, but, uh, it was just, it was just good to be drafted, man. I, I we can worry about the rest of the business aspect of it uh, uh later is it, i found out a lot that that in being in the nba you know you, you learn the the business aspect of it too I, I could play basketball that was not a problem but the business aspect i i i learned a lot you know were you were you excited or more nervous going to such a big city of chicago yeah uh, um excited and nervous uh both because uh just, you know, being drafted, man, and just going uh, lottery at that time, I didn't understand, you know, as a 20-year-old kid, what lottery pick mean. Now I really understand uh, 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 what it means and, and just how fortunate and how blessed, you know, that I, that I was going lottery back in, you know, as a sophomore in 1983. Yeah, and you mentioned that you could hoop, and, yeah, the stats backed it up because as a rookie, you fit in right away. You averaged eight and a half points, eight assists, two and a half rebounds, 1.5 steals, starting 73 games. The next season would be different as the Bulls selected fellow former McDonald's All-American teammate Michael Jordan in the 1984 draft. And I know Brad had a question about the team dynamic during this time. I did. You know, you've mentioned that MJ was more wide-eyed early on and he didn't really become the, the win-at-all-cost leader until later in his career. You know, how did other teammates feel about such a young guy coming in and being becoming the focal point of that team? You know, I know that was something that like a young LeBron had to fight through early on because he was just given the keys to the franchise while, you know, there are veteran guys trying to feed their families while seeing their roles diminish. So how did your Bulls team handle that? Uh, rightfully so, uh, you know, because he was one talented uh, guy. Um, just a little short history, man. Mike and I go, I always say Mike, before we get to the MJ part, I know him as Michael Jordan first. Uh, we, we got so much history uh, together. Uh, we were uh, high school, McDonald's All-American. Uh, we, we was college All-Americans again. Even when, if you go back, and I had a video, I actually sent it to you. When he got drafted, he mentioned my name that, that we knew each other. But we really, you know, had a lot I of history. Go ahead. I think you were ranked You were ranked higher than him, too, in, in high school, weren't you? I mean, I, 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 a lot of people say I was before my time. Uh, I, I love the kid Charles Barkley and him. I, I got so many stories we can go on and on and on, but I love the kid Charles Barkley and him. Uh, they really all, most of them kind of looked at me with the wide eyes because many saying I was before my time. But uh, at the time, he was a late bloomer. Uh, that year, you had Adrian Branch, you had Anthony Jones, you had guys like that. Bill Martin at the small forward, Emmanuel Farris was ahead of him. But never forget, uh, Mike coming on at, at the five star camp and his his career just just, just took off. But uh, rightfully so, he uh, he deserved all the things that he had because it, it, you know I mean the guys like to go. You know what I'm saying? Whoever could have seen all that coming, but but when when we were with the Bulls and I was there with Quinn Dick, there and Mitchell Wiggins and and you know they were two good guards, but we were not prepared uh, getting ready to see anything like what Michael Jordan was getting ready to, to come and do for the Chicago Bulls. Well, you ma you matched up in college and then Alabama and North Carolina play, and I think that uh, he only had uh, maybe 11 points. <laughs> Don't go there. You're trying to start it up now. I, but, hey, I'm just saying. <laughs> but but he did. He actually, uh, like I said, we could. this is a nice time. You know, we, we good uh, friends and, and, and jokes among each other. He was on the bus one time and saying that he had uh, – 24 points uh, against us. So, you know, I was very, very low key and kind of shot, you would call. And I said, wait a minute, Mike. Wait a minute, Mike. <laughs> Everybody said that. They was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Ain't he's getting ready to talk? I said, yeah, now nah. I said, you may have had 11 on a, on, on a good day. I said, because we came out of Alabama, we played defense down there. And everybody said, oh, snap. Shoot, Mike Enos and told y'all, but <laughs> Uh, I had 11, I think, you know, Jimmy Black really beat us that game. And and, and, and uh, I think it was 
Matt Brad Daugh Matt Daugherty had 14, but he actually really only had 11 points in our, in our matchup the first time. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and and I want to get back to the the MJ thing, but you and I have talked about this in the past. You said one of the things I wish I was a little bit more aggressive to understand the nature of the business. Is that something looking back where you you wish that your career had played out differently? That you wish you had shot more? Because um, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you your career high after this. I um I, I never forget just being around conversation with Isaiah Thomas was having, you know, uh, like this close to him I could hear, him, and he was uh, making a statement saying if this guy understood about shooting like like the business size that that you know when you're on a fast break you pass five and you shoot five i didn't understand that i was like just a such a great ball handler i was just getting the ball to everybody but if i had to do it all over again hindsight i actually would have you know i would have got my my numbers like like they're doing today if you average 10 points back then i, I had everything else in place i just did not shoot the ball you know, uh, I, I came up as a school out of high school, averaged a lot of points, and I could shoot the ball. But being reluctant at time, I think it hurt my career. And if I had to do it all over again, I, I, I really would have, have shot the ball more, you know, because you had to do that then. Yeah. Ennis, do you know your career high in points? Uh, for in, in the pros? Yep. I, I would say 20, I, I believe 21. I, I remember scoring 20 when, 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 I, when, I, when I did against the new, either New York or uh, maybe I think maybe the New York and maybe against the Bulls, I may have have reached either 20, uh, 21 points, I believe. You're right. It was 21 points on December 27th, 1983 against wow. the Bulls. You had, you had two rebounds, eight assists, three steals. You shot nine of 11 from two points. So yeah, you're on the money with that. Blackjack. But I, I want to <laughs> talk, talk about what was mentioned in the last dance. And, you know, everybody's going to talk about what happened in the room, but I want to go back to where your journey with drugs began, which was long before that night. Kind of where did it start? How did you get involved? Kind of everything that led up to that point. Yeah. Well, uh, it's, it's no, you know, um, my, my story is pretty open. You know, I, my testimony, I go around the world. I, I'm, I'm, I've been clean from drugs for 32 years now. You know, and if you talk about doing hindsight, if, if, I, if I could do it over, Again, you know, uh, that's one thing that I, that I regret, you know, like from the drugs aspect, I believe it, I forfeit, you know, I'm not saying I would have made the Hall of Fame, but my career coming up to that point was definitely in line to where, you know what I'm saying, I was a very promising guard. And I, and I think uh, the drugs and alcohol at that time, being being very young and just, you know, immature at the time, it, it really hurt my uh, career. I, I can see that, you know, from the time, uh, you know, it's, it's known in the last day when Michael come up and he said that he was, uh, you know, he came up in the room and, and just, you know, he came in, all his teammates were basically there, you know. I'm not sure who all was there and everything, but uh, I, I believe I was in there also too because I was at a point, you know, in my career that, uh, you know, that I was I was on drugs at the time and everything. And that's something that, you know, I, I regret and, and, and go around the world, you know, uh, to speak about what I was saying. He made a great decision by not going in the room because – I think that's the difference between him being a Hall of Famer and, and me being a journeyman at the time and, and not fulfilling, you know, the, the, that, that part of the call on my life. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the quote from it, he said, quote, it was like things I've never seen in my life. You know, as a young kid, you got your lines over here. You got your weed smokers over here. You got your women over here. Was this something that was just an occasional thing for the Bulls? Was this something that just wrong place, wrong time he came? Well, I, I can't speak for everybody else, but I can speak for myself. I, I knew that, you know, in my hotel room, you know what I'm saying? Because it seemed like everybody should have been in their hotel room. And I always say, why is he around, wandering around uh, in, in the lobby anyway? I, that, that's just an inside joke. But uh, I, I would say that, you know, <laughs> back in the early 80s, uh, you know, a lot of things, uh, you know, it, it, was, it, was, it was known at that time uh, that, that uh, the NBA just see uh, most people, you know, uh, in that era had, you know, had so there was a lot of substance uh, Bruce going around. Let me speak about this on, on, on the team that I was on and everything. Yeah. And, and so you bring up an interesting point and not saying to, to tell on anyone else. Do you think sure. that other teams were doing this and just because there wasn't a documentary and because before social media, we'll never find out about it? Well, I, I think that, you know, in, in the era period, you know, you, you got a lot younger than I was. But when I came up in the era in the 
piece where we, we we wasn't as advanced as it was now and it, all that kind of correlated together you know you had the you know the drugs the you know alcohol and just just even the fans and different things like that i, I think it's a period of time where where just people in america period was, was, was going through it we just happened to be uh, uh athletes we had to be uh sports and it was magnified probably even more but it, it was it was a problem that was in in society you know uh, uh more than anything and then when we just happened to be athletes that got caught up yeah no, and and I certainly appreciate you being honest and upfront about that. I know, you know, even though being 32 years sober, it sometimes might be a little bit of a sensitive subject. Yeah. You'd play one more season with the Bulls before stints with the Cavs, Bullets, Spurs, Hawks, Clippers, Blazers, and sometime in the Philippines, Israel, and Lithuania. And you chose to hang it up after your 1998 season. But I know Coach wanted to ask about your experience playing overseas. Yeah, uh, so you played professionally uh, in the Philippines for a, a couple years, and I know how much that country loves the game of basketball. Um, oh. I'm sh I'm sure you were looked at as an idol over there. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, the Philippines, uh, as far as atmosphere wise, I think one of the greatest atmosphere that I played the game of basketball. You probably won't be able to say to someone from America, "Wow, I play like that in the Philippines," but uh, Lithuania and the Philippines to me had two of the greatest atmosphere uh, to play the game. And uh, in the Philippines, I, I, uh, they told me I was going to play with a team called San Miguel. And if you know anything about San Miguel over in the Philippines, man, I, I mean, you're talking about uh, fan support, man. It's crazy. We had, we had between 10 to 15,000. I mean, when I say fans, these, these, these fans were just, just, just so wild. But one of the greatest times of my life and just I, I had a great time in, in the Philippines. Yeah. I can only imagine, like, because them as a culture, like, they're so good people. I know I've had a lot of uh, Filipino um, people uh, that I've worked with in the past, and I know I'm sure they love the game of basketball. You see Manny Pacquiao and how enthusiastic he is about the game. Um, and then you mentioned Lithuania because I did want to talk about them as well because it is their national sport. Most people don't know that. But uh, you spent a year in Israel, but then at age 35, your last professional year, you led the greatest success for the B.C. Paul Garris winning the 1998 FIBA Sports Cup final. What does that international experience mean to you and uh, knowing how much that team means to Lithuania as uh, Sabonis played there and now, now as a post partial owner, owner, would it feel being part of that in Lithuania, which is much different from the Philippines? They love the sport just the same. Yeah, it was a great time in my life. Uh, you know, I, I knew my career. I, I had figured out at that point that was – not gonna be a superstar anymore but uh you know they were saying hey man we got this job in in in, in the philippines i mean in, in lithuania and they was like man I, I kid you not this this team is like the the chicago bulls of of europe then i was like well what's the name of the team you know and it was like well you know uh abena sabonis uh is it's is his formal team or a team that he's played called zowers and i was like wow but if, if I had to say atmosphere, man, I tell you, I, some of the most talented ball players that I've seen came through like the, like that area of Lithuania, Konis, Lithuania, and, and, that, and the Balkan State, and, and Croatia, and that area over that area. It's, it's so many great players over there. But uh, Zao was one of the uh, uh, best atmosphere and best teams that I, that I played for. Their fan support was like it like the Philippines. It's, it's incredible, man. You, you, talk, you can't play in that atmosphere. I grew up in the hood and I grew up playing basketball all my life. But if, if you couldn't play in that atmosphere, you couldn't play the game. Yeah. And you know, post basketball, I, I like that. It's still being recognized the impact you had at Alabama, even in those two years, because you were inducted into the hall of fame. I know you have some nice memorabilia. Facebook has showed me, I see it in the background. You've also done some public speaking for inspire LLP. You mentioned you, you know, go around the world sharing your story. So, I think that's really awesome that you're just so open and vocal about the experiences you've had in life because you've you've gone through a lot. Yeah, my, uh, I, I'd have to say in '87, I always share with guys. My, uh, God's been good in my life, you know, and I always share uh, uh, passing my testimony on to most people. My mom died at '87. Uh, uh, my dad died kind of two months after she did, you know, and it was just a disruptive moment, uh, you know, in my life, you know. Uh, my mom was my God. You know, I, when I turned profession at, at the University of Alabama, I wanted to give her a house. I wanted to do all those great things. And and when my mom passed away, I was like, wait a minute, God, it don't supposed to happen like this. She don't supposed to die. I, I just got drafted and, and all these things. But 
it really was a, a, a disruptive moment in my life, uh, which changed my life, which started me on, uh, gave me the platform to be able to, you know, talk about my salvation and to just tell so many young kids that if you had to ask them a question, uh, how many people would love to play in the NBA? And they all raised their hand. I was telling them, what are the chances that you would get a guy from Birmingham, Alabama, from 1319, 17th Street North, and that I have literally touched all four corners of the face of this earth through the game of basketball. And I just, I don't think that I could be quiet about it. I, I think that, uh, you know, God's been good to me. Uh, it's from the Michael Jordan to the last dance, man, I played with five of the greatest players to ever play that game. People always, well, who are the five is? I mean, you already know one of them is the GOAT, which is, which is Michael Jordan, uh, Dominique Wilkins, Clyde Drexler, Larry Bird. Man, I had some of the greatest experience in my life, man. Uh, God's been good to me, uh, Eric, and, I, I, and and you guys. I just, I just, I don't mind about sharing it. You know, that's why I'm so transparent about it. Wow, you make me want to pick up a basketball right now and at age 27 try to have an NBA <laughs> career. We're hey, speaking with. I, I remember watching you play. Now you came and played with me. Now and uh, you know, you fast. <laughs> I, I don't know the other two guys on the side of you how good they can be, but you know. <laughs> But I always know, I, me and Eric met each other. We've been, we've been good friends ever since, you know? <laughs> yeah. And we won't talk about my basketball game because we're talking <laughs> with Ennis Watley, 10-year NBA vet. Ennis, we like to get our guests out of here with a little rapid fire, some this or that questions. You game? Sure. I'm, I'm with it. I'm with it. Let's go. All right. You might have not been asked some of these before. So the first one, would you rather score 40 points in a game or get a triple-double? I would say triple double because the era that I'm from is 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 it's like we were true point guards and and to me giving assists is 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 what I live for today. I made a living out of it. Okay. Would you rather be able to play ten different instruments or speak ten different languages? Uh I probably have to say uh ten different languages. Okay. I it makes sense with all the traveling you did. Would you rather yeah, not be able to go ahead? Would you rather not be able to golf for a year or not go to your favorite diner for a year? Now you mess with my emotions, Eric. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but but if I, I have the itch real bad. I, I've had a drug addiction before, but if I can't golf, man, uh, oh. never forget a good friend of mine, George Gervin, said, young fella, pick up those clubs. And ever since I picked up the golf clubs, man, I've been in love with the game. You, know? that, you, ever, you ever been out with Mike uh, golfing? I, I, I haven't. I've been around any. And, and, and Charles Barkley, we're, we're, he's from Leeds, Alabama. I'm from Birmingham. But I hear uh, the stories about the guy. But I, I truly believe I can get both of those guys, man. Not not bragging or anything like that. But I, I kind of work at my game. So I, I, I said the next time that I see Mike, uh, that I was going to challenge him to a game of golf. Uh, uh, Charles Barkley, I believe I can beat in everything, you know? At least yeah, you can yeah. do. I, I, I got you over Charles easy. <laughs> right. Um, the next one, would you rather be hungry no matter how much you eat or tired no matter how much you sleep? Hungry, no matter how much you tired. I'd rather be tired. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Would you rather be the best in the world at one thing or good at everything? I, I definitely would have to go with the one thing because I, I believe that if you can master that one thing, I believe that you you got a you got a story that you can tell, you know. All right, and I know at this point in your life it's probably golf for you. <laughs> well, well, you know, I, I when I get to heaven, I want to play basketball because I still I still love playing, and uh, I didn't got old and slow and everything, but. Uh, uh, all my friends say, and you're still trying to really dream. I said, I just love staying in shape. But if that one thing I could do, if I could play basketball and I get to heaven, I'm, 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 I'm good. I, I love it. I love working out. That's part all of right. what I really Yes. All right. Would you rather always hit a red light for the rest of your life or always get slow internet after the sun goes down? <laughs> uh, give me the low internet. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. He, he got, he got, he got places to go. Yes. What is, <laughs> what is your favorite candy of all time? Oh my God. You say candy. I, I like Reese cups when I was little. Me too. Oh, come on now. Come on. Don't tell me that. I, I love Reese cups. When I was real little, we, we should have to sell candy in order to get money in our class. And I never forget eating up all the Reese Cup because they were so good, man. But I love, I love Reese Cup. <laughs> all right, maybe that's next thing we'll bet on is, uh, is a big supply of Reese's Cups. Last two yes. here. Would you rather find ten dollars on the ground 
or find all of your missing socks. Wow. Oh my God. That's, that's a good one. Uh, <laughs> I, I guess I'll take the $10, you know, cause I can buy some socks, you know, there, there you go. go. There you go. That's the loophole. Okay. All right. The last, the last one here, I leave you open for 10, three pointers. How many are you making? Mm. I'm making, if you know anything about my history, I always shot a good percentage because mm -hmm. I care about my percentage. I, I think I can make four of, 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 of 10. And on a good day, now that I understand to shoot the ball, because I've worked at my shot a lot, I think five would be a good percentage. But I would say four, four, four out of four out of ten would I would make. I mean, four out of ten is, is good. I, I'll challenge you to that. Maybe next, maybe next bet thing we'll do a three point shootout. But Ennis, we really appreciate you joining us. Uh, you know, before we're done, is there anything that you want to promote to our audience? Anything you're working on? Where they can find you? Well, I, I just, I'm really thankful for you guys having me on, man. I, I, I count it as a privilege, man, to be fortunate enough to to be able to play uh, in the NBA for 10 years, to, to be able to travel the, uh, the whole uh, wide world. You know, I have two beautiful sons, man, and, and a beautiful wife, man, that God has blessed me with, man. Uh, I just uh, encourage everybody to just be patient, man, and just, you know, uh, uh, stay safe, get your shot, get 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 vaccine up and everything, uh, and stay patient. And, 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 and most of all, walk in love with each other, whether or not you're black, white, blue, or green, because without love, uh, society or race. And make sure you follow him on Instagram, at Ennis Watley, it's his name. He only has 625 followers. We need to get that follower up, Ennis. <laughs> Okay. Thank you so much, man. But I, I really appreciate you guys uh, having me. Eric's a good friend of mine. So uh, it is so glad to meet you. And I, I love the bull, the bull's gift. You know, we got we got to talk that. Nobody have 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 broke my assist record. Not Kobe White. Not Rondo. Not Derrick Rose. So that I thought I'd just put that little snippet in there right quick. Okay. Yeah, I I did I did forget to mention Woo! that. I did see that on your stats. Yeah. Th thanks, guys. I appreciate you guys having me, man.